called Songs for Mother Gaia. So we're hoping you're going to come to that. And um, Jack Thompson's going to be there playing his mouth organ amongst many other people. So we hope you're there. And then he's going to introduce a song, a film he presented called Give Trees a Chance. So now we have this wonderful history of... Um, what are you saying to me, Benny? Oh, yes. Yes. Yes, Ian Cohen was meant to be here and he can't come. And also Richard Jones was going to be here and uh, he was just a bit, um, bit crook too. So he, 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 you know, we're all getting old. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and Ian Gayard also. Yes, he got exposed to COVID, Ian Gayard, and he just didn't want to take the risk of, you know, coming. So apologies from all those people, but it's still going to be wonderful. So I'd like to introduce you to John Seed, Susie Russell, Dylan Pugh and Nan Nicholson, who are going to give you a sort of a history lesson about the Rainforest Information Centre and NEFA um, and all the things that started them off and what they did and how they made it to be so big and international and how they've just ended up being responsible for saving so much forest in this land. And for that, we thank you all very much. <laughs> Maybe you could start, John. Yeah. Well, uh, Jen suggested that I start, but uh, there's no doubt that it was the Terrania Native Forest Action Group that started everything going, and so I've got to hand it over to the other side here. Is that on? Can you hear me? How's that look? Um, well, the people who started it all, of course, were the Widgibal mob who resisted right from the start and were massacred for it. And the Lismore area was one of the worst massacre areas in the country. So it's a bit presumptuous of us whiteies to come along and say we were the first ones to resist and to protect the land from being destroyed because they, they really were and hats off to them. And also us whiteies are all very, um, very modern because the, the Channon was only settled in 1900. So it's a very short time ago that that land belonged to that mob and they were looking after it and had been caring for it for a long time. So I have to salute them and continue to do that all the time because it's very easy for us to get on our high horse and say we were the, the first ones. Um, all, I can relate that also to the Dunnern Dam because we discovered what the Widgibal knew all along was that there was a burial site at, um, near Dunnern in Fraser Road that is prehistoric, that, prehistoric, that's the term, meaning pre-European. So his, history started with us. <laughs> and so <laughs> before that, there was just other people doing other things. But this burial site is very ancient. It's been there for they don't know how long, and it's connected with the burial sites around Nimbin. And it was also used by all the Widgibal mob up until recently. In fact, they, they still know about it, and they were going there recently. Uncle Gungi, John Roberts, who is the senior knowledge holder, was the one who took archaeologists to this place to show them how important it was, and also in the hope, taking a big risk, that it would stop this dam and any other development. And of course, the Koori mob always takes terrible risk disclosing things because it might be destroyed precisely because they've disclosed it. But they have to hope that it disclosing it means it will be protected. So he disclosed it, took a risk, and we're going to follow that through because he said to me and to many others just before he died, looked us in the eyes and said, you have to stop that dam. So that's, I've taken that as my promise to him that I'll keep going with it. So they weren't the first ones to look after forest. Um, I arrived in 1974. I wasn't the first one either. But I do have to say that the people who lived in the area at that time weren't all that interested or keen on the forest and hadn't even actually been there. When Hugh and I arrived at the top end of Terrania Creek in 1974, we asked the locals about it and none of them had actually been up in the forest, which was really surprising because that's the first thing we did and loved it straight away. Uh, but within months of arriving there, uh, we discovered that um, it was going to be logged. So the same day that I went down to the post box to find a letter from the government saying that we weren't going to get the dole and we were going to starve, Hugh went up to the forest and met some foresters who said they were going to log it. And so that was a bad day. <laughs> um, but we decided to stay and fight with some other local 
people who just moved into the area, a big demographic shift, which I mentioned in one of the other sessions, of people coming up to the border, getting into the warm, wet country, good volcanic soil where you could feed yourself, but not wanting to cross the border into Queensland because that's where Joe Bjorka Peterson was. So we all sort of gathered in this area. But then that spawned a fantastic um, oh, attitude of resistance. I think because a lot of the people were tertiary educated, they knew how to research things and how to fight back. So we were very unpassive, which is what got right up the noses of a lot of the locals, I think, that when we asked, say, to have the logging stopped and we were told it's going ahead, well, we just ignored that and kept going. And they, they kept saying, you don't take the umpire's decision. You just keep resisting. <laughs> and that's, that's, that's what we found was the secret. Just keep on resisting. And as they kept falling back slightly, so at first they were going to clear fell the whole basin. So we made a few objections and they said, OK, we'll, won't clear the rainforest. And that was a subject of a great dispute, what a rainforest was. We won't clear the rainforest, we'll just clear the sides. And then they stepped back a bit further from that. So as they kept stepping back, we kept increasing our demands. So, so they thought we were a bunch of intransigent ratbags, which we were. And, and it's, we've just learnt just keep upping your demands, never give up, and um, keep going for all the different uh, levels of bureaucracy and, and politicians that you can. So all this meant that after lots of writing documents and petitions and letters and submissions and getting nowhere. After five years, so we came in 74, by 79 is when the blockade happened at Terrania Creek. And I wanted to mention in that earlier discussion about uh, action, or, or, um, what, what's the word? <laughs> totally got, but direct action, it didn't exist as a name then, did it? That's why I'm struggling with it. No, a whole, whole lot of things, old, old growth forest didn't exist as a term. Anyway, so with the reason we wanted to um, get going with... Oh, sorry, I've totally lost my thought now. <laughs> Old Codgers disease. <laughs> you should talk about the blockade. Right? Yeah, OK. Well, we we finally had our backs to the wall with the um, when our submissions and all the rest of us had got nowhere. So finally, the day came when they said, right, we're moving in. They wouldn't do that these days. They wouldn't warn us so much ahead of time. So they said they were coming in. We had a few people up there. It wasn't a very effective interaction, but very quickly we realised, oh, we need to get a lot more people on side. So we went to the Channon Market, which happened to be at that time, in August, very cold and frosty, and asked people to come, and they did. Un unbelievably, they turned up, came to our place, camped in the frost with no preparations, no bedding. They didn't realise how cold our place was and how dark and wet. <laughs> But they came. And that was, I think, the feeling from that initial arrival of the people. And there's been a lot... Of, this is what I meant to say. There have been five years of preparation, so these blockades don't just happen out of nothing. And it's really easy to say the blockade's what does it. It is important, but they don't exist without the preparation. So we needed the preparation, the blockade happened. And the feeling for me was really amazing because I wasn't part of this sort of hippie... Ethic. I was an earnest little back to the lander who just wanted to be a farmer and, and a hermit. So it was quite a shock when all these Nimbin people moved in with their dope and their goats and their, <laughs> their nakedness. <laughs> so I didn't mind being naked, but it was quite interesting to just see everyone else around in this whole, bringing this whole hippie ethic about clothing, which was fine. I learned a lot. I was learning a lot about rainforest too because I knew nothing about rainforest. And I had to start working out a few species to know what I was talking about. That was another big journey. Anyway, when they all arrived, then things really started to happen because there seems to be a critical mass of people. When you get a few people together, and I can't tell you what the number is. At the Bentley Blockade, for instance, it was a much bigger number. But at Tarania Creek, it was just a critical mass of maybe 100 where all of a sudden people have ideas and do things. So instead of saying, here's what you should do, they say, here's an idea, I'll do it. And it was so exciting to see people just spinning off into different directions to do what they could do. And this is another feature of blockades. Needs appear and people appear to fill those needs. It's just miraculous and, and very exciting to see. So someone would see that the food needed getting from Lismore or we needed firewood or we needed a, um, a plumbing system, we needed hot showers, we needed child minding, we needed first aid, mental and physical. 
all these things just happen like magic. And it's very easy in retrospect to think, oh, that's because we were all so wonderful. But I think, it, I think it's actually just a factor of humans are naturally very cohesive animals because we're herd animals. We're good at looking after each other. And so when you have an external threat like Terrania Creek, people come together and, and start working really well. So that was an exciting time. And then, of course, you had the people who went up in the forest, which it wasn't me because I was stuck on the phone uh, trying to work out where the kids were, which was embarrassing in hindsight, <laughs> and trying to keep a few other things together. So I wasn't doing the heroics up in the forest that all the other people were, climbing trees and stopping bulldozers and things. And I really regret that now. As well as that, all the good food was up at the camp, <laughs> at our cabin. No one was bothering about food, so it was, you're lucky to eat. But up at, I went up the camp a couple of times and thought, geez, what are they eating? And someone had really organised the food and they were having a blinking party. So, <laughs> so look, I, I, perhaps I could go on about this for a long time and we're probably we're meant to be doing the history of activism in this area. So I won't go on about Terrania Creek. But all I can say is... The aftermath. The aftermath. Well, when, well, oh, we had the blockade yeah. and that was one event, but then all the stuff went on afterwards. What, well, what went on afterwards is going up until this point. <laughs> so when we finally won the blockade and the politicians finally had to have an inquiry, <clears throat> that was a difficult thing too and it's a lesson for all of us that inquiries are partly designed to sap all the energy of the main proponents. And that's what happened to us. We were just bogged down in this stupid thing, exhausting us, taking all our money, expecting us to fly to Sydney when we couldn't do that. But in the end, it was a good political move because, as was said earlier, Ran just sat on it. The inquiry came out and said, yeah, log the place. And he, but there was enough political momentum generated by that stage so he could just come out with the decision not to, not to log the place. But then after that, of course, this was just the spark. <clears throat> and, yeah, in hindsight, it sparked everything. But at the time, it was a big risk because some of the border rangers, the people who had been fighting the border rangers rainforest for a long time, much bigger area, came to us and said, could you please shut up because you're taking all the energy out of our fight? And uh, we really thought about that. Um, this is before the blockade. Hugh and I just thought, geez, is this fair to concentrate on this tiny little rainforest and at the expense of all the other rainforest? But we decided in the long run it would be the best to just keep going and generate a lot more publicity, which is what happened. I should say, by the way, that's my phone. Um, I should say, by the way, the same thing happened with the coal seam gas because I was already trying to stop the Danoon Dam and the damn gas field issue turned up. And I thought, ah, they're stealing all my energy. And for a while I just cursed them and then finally moved over and thought, oh, actually, this is really important. So the dam can wait. <laughs> so that's why all my pent-up dam energy is now being expended on it, because I'm going to stop that thing. Um, look, I might stop rabbiting on and leave it to Dylan. <laughs> Okay, well, um, great to hear all of that. I, I, I guess I'll, I'll take off from there. Um, Jenny, I wasn't quite sure what I'd be talking about, and I've prepared a couple of stories, but if it's about the Rainforest Information Centre, then... Um, yeah, well, it, it's just um, the Rainforest Information Centre, when um, they announced the inquiry... And I had somehow got this bee in my bonnet and I'd become totally obsessed about rainforests. Um, and uh, so I, I thought, how can I keep the energy going, you know, without getting sucked into all the bureaucracy that seemed to be emerging? And so I um, got Dylan to draw me a letterhead that said Rainforest Information Centre and that had a couple of the local critters poking their heads up over the bangalow palms. And I started writing letters all over the world um, telling people about Terrania Creek and finding out what was happening to rainforests everywhere else. And then as I got replies from people, um, uh, I put, put the replies together and created a newsletter and um, that became the Rainforest Information Centre. And meanwhile, one of the key people in the Terrania campaign from where I was standing, I think others would agree, was Len Webb, who was the um, uh, head of the... 
uh, CSIRO's Rainforest Ecology Unit in Brisbane. And uh, as I recall, he had been sitting on his hands during the uh, beginnings of those actions um, because he was a forester himself and he knew that if he sp spoke out, he'd get crucified by his profession. Uh, but in the end, he couldn't bear it any longer and he came out publicly and he said, they're right, you know, because we were saying these are really important, they're thousands of years old and the, the forestry was saying, no, these are nothing, these are rubbish and they're uh, 120 years old or something like that. And Len suddenly spoke up, the most prominent rainforest ecologist in the country, and um, as, as he anticipated, he spent years trying to protect himself and to protect his reputation. But anyway, one of the things that, um, one of the things that he got... Uh, me, he, he became like my mentor and he, what he got me to do was to write to... Um, he gave me a, a, the uh, addresses of uh, the most famous ecologists all over the world in, uh, you know, Cambridge and Oxford University, at, at Harvard, all over the place. And um, uh, he composed a letter to write to them um, asking them to write to... Uh, Premier ran about the importance of rainforests and about the importance of Terrania Creek and to send us copies of their letters. And so we received like 50 letters from the most famous ecologists in the world all agreeing with Len about this and we published them as a little booklet called um, World Scientists Write to Premier Ran About Rainforests, and that became one of the tools in the campaign, was these world scientists were on side, but it also became a way that Len could start to protect himself from all of the attacks that he was getting. Um, and then after the, um, after the decision was made uh, about Terrania Creek, when, uh, when Ran um, announced the decision to you know, protect the Nightcap National Park and the other national parks in that day, uh, I ended up writing him two letters that day. One was from John Seed, Rainforest Information Centre, saying... Um, no, well, the, the first one was from N. Kelly, from the Nightmare Action Group, saying, what do you mean only, you know, 50% of the rainforests? The people of New South Wales... An opinion poll found that more than 70% of the people wanted an end to rainforest logging and you've got to stop all rainforest logging. And the other letter was from John Seed at the Rainforest Information Centre saying, oh, great statesman, you've saved the rainforest. Would you please um, write a forward? We'd like to do a kind of uh, a, 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 a new edition of this uh, book about world scientists and we'd like to have your photo in the front and would you write a forward for it? Which he did. <laughs> but anyway, the, the other story that came to me was that... Uh, the day that the decision was announced, or the week that the decision was announced, there was a party celebrating at Bren Claridge's uh, place on Terrania Creek Road, and people came from all over. Murray Wilcox, I think, came up from Sydney or Melbourne or wherever he was. He was the president of the Australian Conservation Foundation, who was, uh, you know, like uh, um, all this stuff going on. And um, I went along to this party, and there was this man there who was the blackest man that I've ever seen and I was introduced to him and he was a, a distant relative of Paul Scobie who was one of the activists of the day and he was Job Dudley Torsinga who was the, um, uh, the chief of a, uh, a community of people in the Solomon Islands and what had happened was that they, there was only one television set in the Solomon Islands in this club in Honiara uh, and they'd been watching the news there and uh, all of a sudden it was Terrania Creek was on the news and there were all these people protecting the rainforest. And so his com and Job was dealing with uh, Levers Pacific Timbers who were destroying the rainforests in north New Georgia. So his, his community sent him over to see if we could find any help to protect their rainforests. And uh, he told me this story on the very night when... I was out of a job for the first time in a couple of years because we just won, as far as I could tell. And so I said, yeah, I'll, I'll come over, you know. And so that's kind of when the Rainforest Information Centre left Australia and uh, moved into uh, other, uh, other fields. Um. <laughs> and, you know, we went on from there to projects all over the world and, um, you know... Uh, 
especially, you know, like I, I was mainly the bureaucrat, but other people like um, John Button in India and uh, Doug Ferguson and Chris Holt in Ecuador and, you know, all uh, hippies from around here who, um, who jumped, uh, jumped in and uh, uh, saved uh, huge amounts of rainforest uh, in many different parts of the world. But anyway, the story that I, I was remembering on my way here, my last story, I think, is um, that, um, how'd it go? When, when the results of the Terrania inquiry were, were released, we, we knew that they'd called the inquiry because they thought the inquiry would cost a million dollars and take a year and a half and everyone would go home and forget about it. And then whatever the inquiry came up with, we might be able to save Terrania Creek, but they could get on with the, the business of logging the rest of the world, you know? And so, um, and that's indeed what happened. And so we knew that they were gonna come up to Mount Nardi and we knew that it, it, it'd be too late by the time they came up to Mount Nardi for, uh, um, you know, to, to sort of build up any momentum. And so um, someone, I can't remember who it was, maybe someone remembers, but anyway, someone went to Hereford Sawmill and followed the logging truck to see where they were logging because they weren't sort of logging in this catchment and uh, went out uh, into the Tweed catchment and they were logging in Greer Scrub, which was actually the other side of Mount Nardi. Like you could stand on Mount Nardi and look down into Gre Greer Scrub, but it was probably a 45 minute drive um, going around there. And um, so we decided that we would uh, do a blockade at Greer Scrub uh, we didn't know Greer Scrub, but we just thought, well, uh, once we start the blockade, it'll be in the news, people will hear about it, and people will start to gather again so that when they get to Mount Nardi, we'll have some momentum, you know, we'll have a chance of stopping them. But then when we actually got to Greer Scrub, we found the biggest and most beautiful eucalyptus grandest flattered gums that anyone had ever seen. And they were just crashing down and all of a sudden we were desperate to do anything that we could to stop it and uh, we were unable to stop it. There was nothing we could do. And in fact, the loggers were so incensed that they started cutting down these big old trees which were hollow up the guts and full of gliders and all kinds of things which smashed into a million pieces when they hit the deck in order to show us that not only weren't we going to save anything, but we were making things much, much worse by being there. They were cutting things that were of no economic value to them. It was only to make a point to us. But, uh, so we failed to, you know, protect anything at Greer Scrub, and I seem to remember you and I got arrested in the same paddy wagon uh, that day, Nan. But um, it, what it meant was that by the time they came up to Mount Nardi, we did have, like, there was 100 people and there was sufficient uh, kind of momentum to do something up there. But um, so one last uh, Mount Nardi story, which was that um, Hereford Sawmills got bought by Robin Brown, which is a much bigger company from Brisbane, I think it was, and uh, there was a court case where Robin Brown got together with uh, the Forestry Commission of New South Wales versus um, the uh, Nightcap Action Group in the form of Di Keevy. We needed a person of straw, someone without any assets that could be taken from them after the court case, and Di Keevy put her hand up. And so it was this huge company plus a government department versus Di Keevy from Tunnable Falls. And, um, uh, but then right in the middle of everything, uh, we found out that the standard, uh, that the, Adelaide Steamship Company had bought Robin Brown. And so we looked into the Adelaide Steamship Company and found out that they also owned David Jones. So two, two uh, combis immediately took off down to Sydney with uh, Gummy and Frog and me. And uh, were you there, Benny? I can't remember. But um, uh, David Jones had a little jingle going at the time which went, shop, shop, shop at David Jones. And so we went in there and we were singing chop, chop, chop at David Jones and handing out flyers and freaking out all the staff and the customers. And they called the police and the police came in and they looked at us and they said, is this all you're gonna do? And we said, yeah, and they just left, you know. <laughs> and so we, we wreaked havoc in David Jones. And uh, the next day, um, a letter arrived at uh, NAG headquarters from 
the lawyers uh, from the Adelaide Steamship Company just full of threats, like, we're going to, you know, and it was just the most horrible letter about what they were going to do to us. And by that time, we'd created a letterhead from the Nightmare Action Group. The Nightcap Action Group had turned into the Nightmare Action Group, and the Nightmare Action Group sent a letter signed by N. Kelly, and twice as threatening as the letter that they'd sent us. And we're like, ah, we're going we're to wipe the floor with you assholes and da-da-da-da-da. And, um, um, and then the next day, there was this very conciliatory letter from the same lawyer saying, uh, dear sir, uh, Mr Kelly, our, um, our client, the Adelaide Steamship Company, only has three members on the board of Robin Brown and there are seven people on the board, so we don't have the, m enough numbers on the board in order to make the decision to stop the logging that you want us to make. And so Ann Kelly wrote back saying, so do I take it that we've got your proxy and that now we can go after the next biggest shareholder in Robin Brown, which is the uh, insurance company in Queensland? And they didn't answer, but at that the next day, Robin Brown dropped out of the court case and left the poor old state forest having to fight Daikivi by themselves. <laughs> um, okay, so I'm going to be a bit more boring and try to give a, <clears throat> an overview of these events. Um, so, um, complaints about rainforest logging um, started up here for Wyangri Plateau. It used to be Wyangri State Forest. It's now in the Border Ranges National Park. And um, they pushed a road up uh, onto the plateau in, uh, in 1972. Um, so there was uh, a local group started up to try and oppose the, um, the logging up there. Um, <coughs> and the government's, re or the forestry's reaction was to create the Grady's Creek Floor Reserve in 1973 and to log the rest of the rainforest on 50% canopy retention. They only take out half the rainforest trees. Um, but the group wasn't satisfied and they put a proposal forward for the 33,000 hectare Border Ranges National Park. Uh, that's, uh, as Nan said, you know, it's a huge area. Um, and in 1975, there's an, an area a bit further to the west, west called Leaders Plateau, that actually the son of the, um, uh, of the saw milling company, Leavers, had uh, uh, protected in about the 1940s. So they'd refused to log this area of hoop pine dominated uh, dry rainforest, and they protected this Leavers Plateau back in 1940. But in 1975, they pushed the road up there and they're ready to start logging it as well. Uh, and then in, um, uh, there were also, um, the, the, the Border Rangers was part of a, a, um, a larger campaign by Sydney groups particularly to protect uh, wilderness areas. So they're after Washpool, New England, Werekimbi and Barrington Tops that were all identified as wilderness areas in 1976. So come the May 1976 state election, Neville Rand was elected. I think he had a one one seat majority or something, he was, you know, just scraped in. Um, and there was this whole inquiry process again, like there was with Trania Creek, they like inquiries because they stacked to come out with bad outcomes. Uh, and that announced there was going to, in 1978, announced it's going to be a snake-like Border Ranges National Park. So they were going to uh, revoke the Grady Creek Floor Reserve and log it, and they were going to um, log Leavers Plateau and then make them into a national park after they logged it. So they already logged most of the rest of the rainforest by then up there, this huge, fantastic stand of rainforest. Um, and that's where um, Trania Creek came in. So here we had uh, a, a reluctant state government that wasn't, didn't want to protect even the Border Ranges National Park, let alone these other wilderness areas, and there were uh, EISs prepared for a number of them, but they, the intent was always to go on logging them, you know, and you, you listen to some of the ministers at the time, it was always log, 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 money, 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 jobs, jobs, jobs. Um, so Trania Creek then uh, interrupted this process and the Sydney groups didn't support it, as Nan said. They didn't want this little backyard issue to interfere with their big campaigns for these wilderness areas and particularly the uh, border ranges. Um, but what Trania Creek did was changed the whole debate, you know. It got in the, in the, in the state and national media and, and international. Um, it made rainforest the issue. And, and this was the key outcome of, of Terania Creek. It wasn't this little backyard that was being fought about and 
there was this argument, as Nan said, between, OK, we're not going to log the rainforest anymore, we're going to log the rainforest with brush box over it, which we don't call rainforest because it's got brush box over it, and even though brush box means rainforest box, it's not rainforest. So that was their argument. Um, but Trainy Creek was the rainforest issue. It made rainforest into uh, a national issue um, to the point uh, to the point that in um, on 26th of October 1982, the New South Wales government announced their rainforest decision, and that was to protect 120,000 hectares of forest with large, and that included most of the larger intact areas of rainforest. Now, I'd like to emphasise these areas weren't on the political agenda and would not have been protected if it wasn't, wasn't for Terrania Creek making it into rainforest into a political issue. So that was creating or expanding the nightcap Border Ranges, Washpool, Dorigo, New England, Werekimbi and Barrington Tops National Parks. These were major achievements way back then and most of these were large areas of old growth and rainforest mixed in. They created the Mount Seaview and Mount Highland Nature Reserves and just, just west of here on the Richmond Range they created the Murray Scrub, Sandy Creek and Cambridge Plateau Flora Reserves. So this was a major decision but it wasn't the ending of logging of rainforest and um, at the time, a lot of groups and said it was, and Sydney groups even put out a, um, a pamphlet, How We Saved the Rainforest, but it was only a small part of them, and they went on logging rainforest. And I, I was involved in trying to protect rainforest further out west in the upper Clarence Valley, and it became really hard because no one would believe me they were still logging rainforest anymore. Um, but part of the announcement was that logging would be phased out by 1990. Uh, and then in 1986, they put all these new rainforest reserves uh, on the World Heritage List as the subtropical and temperate rainforest of Eastern Australia. And that was done by the RAND government in order to stop a coalition government being re-elected and logging them, which is what they said they were going to do. They are going to reopen all these reserves for logging. Um, so, um, uh, as John mentioned, there was the Kiddy case, you know, and the Kiddy case was um, of fundamental importance. So the argument was they shouldn't be logging rainforest unless they do an environmental impact statement. Um, they, the, the EPA Act had come into existence in 1979. This was really the first major test of, the, of that uh, act. And uh, it, it was uh, of fundamental importance because it proved that yes, they did need to do an EIS. But secondly, because the decision came down on the 22nd of October, that uh, yes, there should be an injunction on logging on uh, Mount Nardi, and that was just before the rainforest decision on the 26th of October. So it, 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 it was part of the momentum for that, that rainforest decision. Um, so the, that case set a precedent. For example, um, I was, as I said, I was working on rainforest out further west. I, I wrote a, got a, um, a solicitor to write a legal letter to the forestry for an area of rainforest they're just about to log. They just pushed this huge road up there saying that if they proceeded, um, I would um, commence legal action. Like, I had enough money to get one letter written by, by, by a solicitor. I couldn't possibly have done anything else. But that was enough. It protected that area of rainforest. And um, uh, it was also used in a number of other cases to do money with old growth forests further down south. And in 1988, I used that to pick this area called Dome Mountain, about 3,000 hectares of old growth forest, uh, where again, uh, I threatened to take the forestry to court, but that time I'd actually found a solicitor who was prepared to do it pro bono, you know, and um, so we actually did commence the case. But it was all based upon the precedent set by the Kibbe case. Uh, so really that's my summation of, uh, of the rainforest decision. And uh, should I go on to old growth now? Or? Um, okay, so in the, um, uh, in the late 1980s, there were localised campaigns so to protect old growth eucalypt forests. You know, I, these are forests dominated by these giant eucalypts that are hundreds of years old, uh, you know, over 500 years. In, in the case of Trinity Creek, they uh, carbon dated during the Trinity Creek dispute. Uh, a brush box is 1,300 years old, and I did find a reference in one forestry corporation fine to file to one being over 2,000 years old. And, and look, there's no doubt they are. They're just massive, big old trees, and uh, uh, they're fantastic, and they're probably the oldest trees we get. Most eucalypts only live to about 500 years. 
you know, 500 years is a long time, you know, and, uh, and they're magnificent, grand uh, survivors of, of a past, you know, a long time ago in, in, in our terms, in terms of European settlement. Um, so um, I'd become, a, become aware of them and uh, I'd got involved with, as I said, with Dome Mountain, trying to protect the old growth forest there. Locally, there was the Black Butt Plateau just uh, near Mullumbimby where there was a group trying to protect old growth forests on the Black Butt Plateau. But there were other groups throughout North East New South Wales, right down to Mount Royal the, the, in, the, in the Hunter Valley. Um, so... Um, Basically, after the rainforest decision, the Sydney groups were telling us, oh, well, we've made your decision for North East New South Wales. We don't really want to be involved anymore. Um, so uh, we decided that by working together, we could um, uh, help all our individual cases and, and working on general themes. And our themes were, you know, rainforest, old growth forest, uh, threatened species and wilderness. Uh, but really most of us had come together because of patches of old growth that were in our backyards, as it were, that we wanted to protect. But by working together, it gave us uh, a, a bigger voice, a voice that could be listened to. And by working together, it meant that if someone had a, a, an action down uh, somewhere south or somewhere up here, then others would come to help them. So uh, th that made us a lot more powerful than uh, it would be otherwise. So we were formed on... World Environment Day at the Big Scrub Environment Centre in, uh, that then existed in Lismore. Um, and then we went on to have another meeting in, um, in Grafton in, I think, in, in August that year. And um, one of the issues that time, uh, at that time was North Wash Pool. So North Wash Pool was a big uh, uh, old growth wilderness area with patches of temperate rainforest in it. And it was one of those areas that was left out of the rainforest decision uh, to provide timber to the industry. So they'd been go gone on logging rainforests there ever since. And so this was 1989. I meant to stop rainforest logging by 1990, but they'd thrown that promise out the window. And uh, the member uh, for Clarence at that time, uh, Causley, was about to give a wood supply agreement to Big River Timbers who were logging the rainforest to go on indefinitely, you know. So... Um, uh, so we had a blockade there in, in 1990 and uh, it stopped the logging because the local Aboriginal people were concerned about their sites that this logging road was going into and uh, they joined the blockade and it turned out that um, there had been an, an environmental impact statement done for Washpool which said they couldn't proceed with logging until they consulted with the Aboriginal people and they just ignored that and gone on logging all these Aboriginal areas. In this case, in including significant Aboriginal sites. Uh, so forestry were forced to stop because they were doing the wrong thing and um, they bulldozed through a borer ring and into it anyway. Um, so then that, that was about a year went by and um, they identified a, a 1,100 hectare Aboriginal site over the main part of the valley where the, where the sites were and started trying to log on the other side of, of Washpool, again into this wilderness area, continuing rainforest logging. Um, at that time, we took them to court. Well, we had a, a blockade, but you know, it was <laughs> only, only a, a, a dozen or so people at the final blockade. Then we took them to court and... Um, uh, proved that they weren't abiding by their environmental impact statement. They were logging rainforest that was meant to be protected. They were meant to retain 50% of the canopy of the rainforest and they were clear felling it. They, oh, a whole raft of things they were doing wrong. And they weren't even preparing harvesting plans like they were leg legally required. Um, so to settle that case... So, so we, we had an a, a initial um, hearing and... Uh, forestry were found to have been uh, operating Ill illegally, unlawfully. Uh, and the judge's um, decision was damning of forestry for doing this illegal logging. And so forestry were then really worried about going to full trial. So they settled out of court and the agreement was we'll do a real rehabilitation plan. So they appointed experts, we appointed experts to sit down and work out how you rehabilitate the rainforest, how you, you rehabilitate all the badly eroded areas, and then they had to implement that plan. So um, that, was, that was sort of the end of rainforest logging, if you like, in, uh, of mapped rainforest. As, as Nan said, there was this uh, definitional problem about what, what was really rainforest, but of mapped rainforest that brought, finally brought an end to it. Um, 
Uh, I think I think there was somewhere else further south where the logging was still going on, but in 1992, uh, rainforest log mapped rainforest logging stopped at that time. So the other issue, of course, was was old growth forests. So um, uh, NISA got established because we're trying to protect all these patches of old growth forest. So we started doing surveys in them with the idea of taking court cases based on the Kibbe precedent in that you need to do an EIS before you could log old growth forest, not just rainforest was our argument. Um, so we started, we had a case down about Mount Royal, an area of old growth we'd surveyed and, and we won that case. Then we had one on Chilundi in 1990 where we had um, John came along to that. We had this. Um, uh, we were doing a, a, um, a vote for the forest campaign, and we decided that Slundy was a good area to. We'd already done fauna surveys there. That was a good good area to make a case of. So we had a blockade there. I, I don't know, was it 15 of us, a dozen of us, or something. John, not, not that many. Um, and then I got the cops to um, take me down to Grafton as quickly as I could, so I could fly down to Sydney and, and work on our court case. <laughs> And, and they obliged, you know, the, the, the cop in charge was, was really good. Um, and because um, uh, we were saying it was illegal and they shouldn't be doing it, and he was happy to facilitate a decision on that. Um, and so uh, we won that case in, in the terms of Chilundi. And um, so NISA had been formed in, on World Environment Day in, in June uh, uh, 1989. No one knew the word old growth. It just didn't, it wasn't in the local uh, language, as it were. And by June 1990, because of our blockade and our court cases, we got, a mor we got the Griner government, who had no intention whatsoever to do it, to do a moratorium over 180,000 hectares of old growth forests in, in North East New South Wales. Um, so that was pretty good. Um, then they went and tried to log in Chlundi again, but we then had a, another blockade, and this one was far more effective. You know, um, we had hundreds of people arrested. We had uh, a minimum of 80 people there at any one time, and Chlundi's in the middle of nowhere. You know, I went out there recently, and I just wondered how we managed to get people to go out there. It was just sort of nowhere near anything. Um, and we held the road for 10 days. We, we had... Um, sort of like a three-month lead-in, so people buried pipes in the road and across the road and we had tripods and bipods and monopods and you name it. It was a really inventive thing and people buried in the road. I think we got the old Rick van out there and someone was chained onto the Rick van and buried in the road underneath. You know, some really good inventive blockading techniques were, were um, developed there. Uh, and uh, But eventually they got in after, after 10 days and at, at that time we got uh, our... Uh, uh, barrister advised us that maybe we had chance under the, uh, under the National Parks and Wildlife Act to prove they were taking and killing endangered species without our licence. Um, so we won that court case and because of all the leading to it, um, uh, it, it became a really significant issue. And uh, then the, um, we we're also in the other uh, advantageous position like we are at the moment where we had a, uh, a hung parliament and, um, and the opposition, the ALP, introduced the Endangered Fauna Interim Protection Act as a way of um, protecting threatened species. And so that was our first threatened species legislation in New South Wales. Um, and then we had this whole um, messy political process that followed. And um, as part of Griner government trying to get support of, <coughs> of Mesril, who had gone independent because of, the, of what they'd done to threatened species and so on, um, he got uh, found to have uh, acted corruptly through trying to offer Mesril a job in return for him uh, resigning from Parliament because he had been a Liberal Party person and also supporting what they called their Timber Industry Interim Protection Act. Uh, so he had to resign over those corruption allegations. Um, and, yeah, I, look, it, it gets very lengthy after that, but um, uh, I, I suppose... Uh, we had blockades all over the place, um, actions, fighting EISs. Um, it was quite a, uh, a very busy period. In 1994, we joined with other groups to take on the federal government over export wood chipping. We had rallies and demonstrations, and, um, and up here we had blockades to stop them logging these forests that were going to be going for export wood chipping. Um, and because of the, you know, and the, and the industry had their famous. Uh, uh, blockade, uh, the, the, the unions blockaded Parliament House and broke the, the front windows and all that sort of stuff. So we had our blockade and they, and they had theirs and theirs were more violent than ours. 
Um, but what that, the outcome of that was that uh, Bob Carr was seeking election. The ALP were severely tarnished over the whole saga of the export wood chipping, where they just backed down totally. Um, and so he promised to protect old growth forests if he was elected, but only high conservation value old growth forests. Um, so one thing he did agree to do was set up a, an assessment process of the forest to work out which areas should be protected. We had these, um, uh, we had a, a national forest policy and we had, a, we had a national reserve criteria for forests and this was all part of the federal process where they're meant to be resolving what, what gets protected and not. Um, as, as an outcome of that, we got um, uh, most uh, old growth and rainforest mapped. Um, obviously, we got all old growth and rainforest mapped on, on public and private land, overcoming the Trainy Creek problem of, you know, just because it's got brush box in it doesn't mean it's not rainforest. So we suddenly had all this additional rainforest hadn't been identified before. Um, and we, they were still only committed to protecting HCV old growth. So um, not all the old growth was protected. Um, so, um, but, but that, I think that was pretty significant. And from, from the period of NEFA's formation until 2003, we had um, 740,000 hectares of new national parks created in, in North East New South Wales and 310,000 hectares of special management zones on state forests, which are mostly old growth and rainforests that were mapped at the time. And, um, yeah, so that's really what we achieved in that initial period. I, I'd like to talk about wine wine, but let someone else talk for a minute first, because we had another action at wine wine in 1994. I said to Dylan earlier, I th I'm the new kid on the block, and he said, well, actually, you've been involved in NIFA for 30 years, so you're not that new kid on the block. But um, so uh, I got involved when um, I suppose the first time I saw an old growth forest, which was with Marg and Barry in um, Davis Creek at Mount Royal. And I realised that I had never actually seen an old growth forest before. And I, um, you said, Nan, that people don't tend to go to the forest. And I think that's still the case. I think the forests are at the ends of the road and most people don't go. And so most people really don't know what the issues are and what an old growth forest is and even what a rainforest is. I think it's largely still a mystery from people's first-hand experience. And I know it certainly changed my life. And when I ended up settling in a little village called Elands that some of you might know west of Port Macquarie uh, with my partner Greg... Um, ..we... Uh, someone took us out to show us some old growth out there in the Bulga State Forest and we it was like a revelation to me that they were still chopping down trees like that. It's like come from Victoria and Melbourne and it was like surely no one's still chopping down trees like that in 1992. Um, so I suppose uh, got involved locally and then um, my local group um, was a part of NEFA and as we geared up in 1993 to try and defend that patch of old growth, someone from NEFA turned up to have a look to see whether our blockade was worthy of being a NEFA blockade. <laughs> and, um, and uh, you know, gave us the once over and asked us a few questions and, you know, wanted to have a look at the forest and decided that we, um, we were OK and, and that we should call a red alert and have a NEFA blockade. And I said, um, I, no, it was Jono. And, um, and I said, surely it should be a green alert because, you know, we're green. And, and he said, no, a red alert if you want people to come. And I went, oh, OK. And uh, so out went this release, this alert on the fax machine to somewhere. And uh, for a particular day that a blockade was going to start. And then, to my absolute amazement, on that day, all these vehicles rolled into the village with all these people. You know, Ian Cohen came and, you know, the Toonambar boys came and there was just this... A, a lot of people came and, um, and it began this period which started out as weeks 
of blockading out in the Bulga forest and and um, after several weeks we'd, you know, we'd pretty much lost and it ended up moving into a blockade in the Doyles River forest and it was sort of that process where you can, uh, you can throw yourself at the machine uh, a lot but ultimately the machines tend to win unless you've got a secondary strategy and um, for us that was a court case where we thought we had an angle to challenge the, um, the fauna impact statement which was required at the time. And um, so we, off we went to court, our little group, Wingham Forest Action with our person of straw. And, um, and uh, we, we found ourselves in court with a very inexperienced barrister um, up against a QC who was a former Land and Environment Court judge. And uh, after about two days of having nearly all our evidence um, knocked out by... Um, points of order and the judge agreeing with the QC and the whole thing was going to be a complete disaster. Uh, we ended up um, in the depths of despair back at our sort of bunker in Redfern and decided that the only way forward was that we would sack the barrister um, and run the case ourselves. And that... Um, so I ended up being the aid, what was I? Whatever I was, the advocate, the thing, the person that gets up and pretends that they're a barrister when they know nothing about the law. Um, and Dylan ended up being the advisor. And there we were sat sitting at the table, um, you know, fronting up at court with the QC looking really, really unhappy. Um, and we had to then run this court case, which... Um, they had thought would be over the next day but ended up, I think it went for another week or two or something after that and, and there were so many sort of funny aspects to it but um, one of the important things that we were able to do was to be able to get the judge to come and have a look at the forest um, and, take, and take the judge spotlighting and having that magic moment where you see a pair of greater gliders up in the tree and it's just, you know, they were just sort of like cuddling up together, it was the most perfect moment. And so even though, um, even though we didn't win our case, we, we, went, we won a few concessions um, and we, I guess we sort of helped contribute to that uh, movement which was leading towards Bob Carr saying, we will protect the high conservation value old growth. So I went from someone who knew nothing about forests to someone who found themselves sort of caught up in a frenzy of processes and committees and meetings and going to Sydney and meeting politicians and, you know, standing for the Greens and doing all everything, everything that was needed, really. I guess that's what the forests have shown me, is that you can be a Jill of all trades, you know, you can be a lawyer, you can be a politician, you can be a whatever it is... Um, with the purpose of, of trying to um, see our forest protected. And here we are now all these many years later and, um, and we, aren't, we aren't taking people so much to see the magnificent old trees anymore, partly because they're a long way away and they're very hard to find, unfortunately. There are some good patches. But what we're trying now to do is to um, get the the decision makers and the people to understand that our national park system are a series of islands. And unless we connect the islands um, and, and build connectivity into our reserve system, then we are dooming the small populations of critters and, and plants as well that are in those islands because they need to move. Climate change is requiring movement and uh, movement to higher altitude, movement to, uh, towards the poles, everything is changing. And we need to build that connectivity in our reserve system. So here we are, 30 years later, and, um, and I find myself still with the Northeast Forest Alliance. Um, we're trying to fight off uh, burning forests in power stations for energy. There's a proposal in Newcastle wants to burn a million tonnes of wood a year. 
um, most of it from forests and land clearing to uh, get green energy to make green hydrogen. So, you know, hey, that sounds green. Um, and, uh, and now uh, we're trying to save trees that are, well, they're just not that very big. And so some of you might have heard over summer about Bulga State Forest and Save Bulga. I hope it appeared on some of your news feeds. That was our little campaign in our neck of the woods where we, we actually managed to uh, get them to withdraw from Bulga State Forest. And as an aside, one of the good things we found out is that forestry have a risk matrix. And if you can press enough buttons, um, like you can get media and politicians asking questions and a variety of things, then that comes up as a very high risk scenario and they tend to back off. So we, we were pretty pleased. We realised we'd actually pressed the high risk button over summer and they backed off um, and enabled us to go further afield and started looking at some of the other forests uh, that were a bit further away. And one of them was a forest called Yarrett, which is just out of Taree which is um, really high conservation koala habitat. But there's hardly a hollow tree to be found. And you go into a lot of forests now and you realise there are no hollow bearing trees. There is no habitat for gliders and owls and parrots and cockatoos. And it's gone because that's, the, that's been the impact of what forestry have done since they've been doing their thing. They have been destroying the habitat that makes those forests now... Uh, like deserts in many ways for wildlife. There just isn't the wildlife there. But it's, this forest was still good for koalas. And, um, and the, the first scouts that went down and said, we're not going to go and do an action down there, are we? I mean, the trees are like... It's like a plantation, you know? The trees are really small. And um, it took a, a lot of argument um, amongst our little crew to decide that we were going to go down and... and stop the logging in Yarrett State Forest, koala habitat, because the trees didn't look sexy, you know? They weren't big. And that's, that's, that's what we need to do now. We need to fight for the smaller trees, you know? We need to fight for the trees that might, be get, might become bigger <laughs> if they get a chance, uh, that might be able to be habitat, that maybe we can attach nest boxes to to help bring back some of the animals. So... Um, so that was my sort of NEFA thing. And then uh, I'll just say that... Um, and then I just thought on the side when John said that he thought he didn't know if he could keep the Rainforest Information Centre going, I went, oh, no, that's terrible. You know, we need to, we need to do that and we need to keep it going. I said I'd help. Um, fortunately, I'm a double package. I don't know where the other half is. He's gone off somewhere. But um, Greg is an absolute whiz at many things who has been an absolute lifesaver for the Rainforest Information Centre when it comes to our books and our technology and our every other thing. Um, and uh, together with the wonderful woman from Tasmania, Liz Downs, we have managed to keep it together. Um, I think you should tell the story about Los Cedros. Oh, thanks, Susie. Yeah, I um, uh, health issues and uh, I suddenly realised that I couldn't uh, keep going at a certain point. And back on the committee now, but um, there's other people that are, you know, doing most of the heavy lifting. But um, the story at the moment that's really exciting is that um, back in the uh, late 80s, uh, we received, a, I guess it was a... I guess it was a, um, an aerogram. So I guess there's a few people here old enough to remember what those are. Uh, from um, Ecuador, from uh, a guy called Jaime Levy, who was a volunteer with the Peace Corps, an American guy, working uh, uh, on the Colombian border with an indigenous group called the Awa. And he'd heard somehow that um, there was people in Australia interested in saving rainforests. And he said, uh, we need your help. And so we did a benefit and uh, Doug Ferguson, who some of you know, uh, went over there to see what we could do. And that uh, he ended up living there for seven years or more and uh, saved more rainforest than any other person that I know during that time. 
But uh, with the Awa, it turned out that the government was quite happy to, um, uh, for them to have control over their 300,000 hectares. But uh, unless there was a line on the ground that corresponded to the line on the map uh, that showed where their territory began and ended, there was no stopping the colonisation, which was sweeping like a cancer through that part of the world. And so um, Doug and uh, Chris Holt from Tantable, um went over there and working with the Awa, they uh, uh, spent months uh, with machetes and, uh, and axes clearing. At, at, oh, and we had to hire a surveyor from the, uh, from the government. Uh, like the government provided the surveyor who would tick off that the line that we were cutting on the ground corresponded to the line on the map, but we had to pay his wages. Anyway, so the surveyor and Doug and Chris and, uh, um, you know, a big party of Awa cleared this 20 metre wide strip through the jungle uh, to mark the border of their territory. And at that time, the same thing was happening in Brazil. And some of you may remember the musician Sting was cutting a, cutting a similar kind of a line, but he was putting cement posts every so often so that the line wouldn't disappear when the jungle ate it up. But where we were in Ecuador, a cement post would have disappeared in, you know, very few years. And so what Doug and Chris did was they planted distinctive uh, native trees um, uh, a, 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 Along that, uh, along that cleared swathe. And these were also fruit-bearing trees, which were the fruit that the local monkeys liked to eat, which meant that there was always going to be a plentiful supply of monkeys along there so that when the Awa uh, patrolled that uh, section, they would, um, there'd always be food for the, for, the, uh, for the men doing the patrols to keep the colonisers out. And in that way, that 300,000 hectares is, uh, is still there. But meanwhile, yeah, yeah amazing. And uh, meanwhile, um, Doug was approached by this American ex expat refugee called uh, Jose de Cou. And later on, um, when I travelled in uh, South America, uh, I, discussed, I ran into a whole bunch of these people who had all flown down in uh, the same aeroplane that at a certain point, uh, all of these draft dodgers from San Francisco were offered uh, a free ticket down to South America by Owsley, the, um, the acid chemist, uh, uh, hired a jumbo jet to, for escaping draft dodgers from San Francisco. And, and all the way down Ecuador, Peru, Chile, Argentina, you can still see them and their descendants, and they are now... It's the equivalent of Nimbin. They're the conservation movement now. The, these these uh, people and their children in that. Anyway, so Jose was one of these guys, and uh, he uh, he had no money and uh, ended up as a labourer on Don Pepe's plantation. And as a landless poor labourer, his only way of getting ahead was to colonise. That uh, the land reform laws were such that if you could find a piece of land, i.e. virgin rainforest, uh, and if you cleared it and put a fence around it, then that was the first steps to getting title and to being able to get ahead. So um, uh, one day Jose walked up uh, the Andes and found himself on the Los Cedros Plateau and started clearing his patch that he was going to colonise, but had this epiphany where he suddenly realised where he was and that... Uh, it, this had to be stopped. So he went looking for help and he found Doug and somehow managed to drag Doug up to the plateau, which is like an amazing slog getting up there. But um, uh, anyway, Doug was convinced. And so, um, okay, so at that time, uh, this was just after the victory down at the Franklin River, which uh, Benny and me and quite a few of the people here were also part of that. And that, uh, that victory at the Franklin, which is what brought um, uh, Bob Hawke into power, uh, was the start of a honeymoon period between the environmental movement and the federal ALP that lasted for a couple of years. And during that time, one of the things that the uh, ALP did was they created a... Uh, we, had a uh, we had pushed through... Uh, an inquiry into the environmental effects of the Australian government's aid program, and we'd created far-reaching changes in AusAid and uh, 
uh, in their environmental um, rules that govern them. But one of the things that the Senate inquiry did was it required AusAid to create a new funding window of a million dollars a year, which was available to Australian environment groups to create new standards of environmental excellence in the delivery of the Australian aid program. So at the Rainforest Information Centre, we knew we'd never see any of that money because we had been the main thorn in their side. But to our amazement, every proposal that we put to them over the next two years while that program existed, they funded. And we realised pretty quickly that they thought that because they were funding us, we would be uh, in a position where we wouldn't be able to criticise them any longer because we'd be receiving their money. But we'd thought of that. And so... Um, uh, Doug Ferguson's ex-wife, Carol Sherman, and Lee Rhiannon, who later on went became a Greens uh, uh, senator, uh, we started a new a group called Aid Watch so that they could continue to harass AusAid and we could be spending their money. <laughs> but anyway, that's kind of a long, a long story to say that we got a grant from the Australian government to buy out the people who had started to colonise Los Cedros, that uh, various people had started clearing. And so we paid them for the work that they'd already done in order to get them out of there in order uh, as one of the steps to protecting it. And the Ecuadorian government was so stunned that, that the Australian government was getting involved in this thing that they gave us title to the entire plateau, 7,000 hectares. And Jose de Cou has been managing that and looking after that ever since and it's a, an important scientific reserve and so on. But meanwhile, nothing stays saved for very long and so every couple of years there'd be a new plea from Jose, uh, land developers had moved in, there was hunters poaching the animals, you know, the loggers were coming and, you know, time after time we'd have to raise some money or do something to protect it again and again. And the last time was that a corrupt government decisions three or four years ago <coughs> meant that um, a certain designation of forest, Boscus protectoris, protected forests, two million hectares, which had been out of bounds, were suddenly available for mining companies and mining companies took up concessions. The trees were protected, but whatever's underneath the ground was fair game. And, uh, um, and of course, you had to cut the trees down to get under the ground and so on. But... Um, uh, so we started a series of legal cases against Cornerstone, the Canadian mining company that had concessions at Los Cedros. Now, Ecuador is the first country in the world that includes the rights of nature in its constitution, but that had never been tested. And so once our court cases reached the highest court, which was the constitutional court, our last case about 18 months ago, was based upon the rights of nature. We said that uh, they shouldn't be mining at Los Cedros because it was infringing on the rights of nature. And to everyone's astonishment, the Constitutional Court agreed with us and ejected the mining company. And um, so then, uh, then with Susie and Greg and uh, this uh, uh, woman from Tasmania, Liz Downs, that Susie mentioned, uh, who... Uh, um, uh, uh, you know, is an amazing powerhouse. Uh, um, we've been looking for other communities in Ecuador that are uh, wanting to protect Aboscus protectoris from mining and trying to help to seed other court cases based upon the precedent that got set at Los Cedros. And the first of those just came through a little while ago. And so it's an ongoing process of uh, where well, Los Cedros is like the Terrania Creek of, um, of, 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 of that part of the world where the energy that got created in one little spot is going to be helping to uh, protect uh, many others. So the Rainforest Information Centre has been going for um, nearly as long as, um, you know, well, more than, you know, 40 years or so. So there are hundreds and hundreds of stories, but I'll just leave it at that one and... Um, We've only got about five minutes left and I'd just like to go back to Nan and then all of you in the order we've been um, hearing and just say how many years have you been at this in each case 
what do you think the hardships have been on you from doing this work? Do you think it's worthwhile? I mean, has it been worthwhile in your own lives? Would you do it again? I think that's not working. Oh, aren't they terrific questions? Um, in my case, I've been doing it since I was 18. I um, uh, then just started up university at La Trobe in Melbourne and was incensed about the rise of cars. And there's a big vehicle exhibition at the exhibition buildings in Melbourne. So I managed to get my hands on this big bag of World War I gas masks, these great big ugly things for a song, of course. So I staged this two or three person um, stunt outside the exhibition buildings trying to get these cars stopped. <laughs> Didn't work. But anyway, that was the start. And then as soon as Hugh and I came up to the Northern Rivers and were immediately plunged into protection of land, then that's where that started. So I've been doing that for a very long time because I'm 70 now. And um, the hardships, of course, are financial and stress and relationships, although fortunately Hugh's and mine survived. And, and he's often said that's because we both lack imagination. But, <laughs> but anyway, the relationship survived. The financial stresses were hard and the, just the general stress and not doing the things you want to do. But the payoff is just 100 times worth all the stresses of it, partly because you get to hang out with all these really nice, interesting people and, and you feel good about yourself. But it's the antidote to depression because the facts are so bad, when you look around you and look at what's going on, you could go and shoot yourself. But the only way to do, to fight that is to actually get into action. And I remember a great quote from Bob Brown, he said, I tried depression for 10 years and I decided it didn't work. And, so, and, so, and I thought, that's exactly right. That, that's why I, I keep saying to people, just do this, even though you often, or you could even say mostly lose with the blockades. Um, I've been to lots of blockades I've been to have lost, but enough of one to keep you going. I remember Susie Russell once, probably don't remember this. I asked her what, how she had the energy to keep going and she said, it's because I keep winning. So, <laughs> must have been in the middle of all those court cases that they kept on winning. But win or lose, it's worth doing it anyway because just causing trouble enough for, for the bastards is a good enough source of joy. And uh, that's what's motivated me, just resistance is the, is the source of joy. So I'll just keep doing that as long as I can because it's fun. And, and, and if you win, it's even better. So I just say, don't worry about the, the costs. In, the, in hindsight, you look back and say, it was all totally worth it. And to paraphrase um, Paddy Pallon, who said, the only trips you regret are, are the ones you don't do, in my case, the only actions that I regret are the ones I didn't attend. And, and there's lots of those. So I'm, I've got a big guilt problem, but probably lots of other people have got that too. Do you want to... um, so <coughs> I probably started in... Sorry? Sorry? <laughs> okay, so I'll be really quick. So I probably started in, um, in, in late high school with the Vietnam War. I moved up, up here in the late 70s and got uh, activated by Trania Creek in 79. And really it was the victory at Trania Creek that propelled me on. I mean, you know, that was a major win and we protected this patch of rainforest which was, and old growth forest, which was just lovely, you know. And so that, that's all the payment you need. Uh, and I went on then to, I, I proposed some floor reserves further out west in the upper Clarence Valley and you know, I got over a thousand hectares of them protected, so these other nice patches of good old growth uh, 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 rainforest and look it's gone on you, you know you you win some you lose some but I, I think we've won more than we've lost and there's lots of areas of old growth forest that I was one of the people who contributed to protecting uh, for all time uh, climate change aside and, and fires aside um, it, look it, it's an immense reward I mean it's priceless we're getting paid a fortune for our time and effort and and everyone who contributes helps contribute to that outcome. And uh, I think uh, I worked out with NIFA that over our first um, decade or something, we were picking like a few hundred hectares a day. Um, and some days only one person working on the campaign, other times there might have been a hundred. But each of those people contributed to that outcome. And, um, uh, you know, I, I, I couldn't... 
I couldn't do anything better with my life, really. Um, and that's why I'm back doing forest again at the moment. I'd like to see it through. Um, uh, it's an immense reward, an immense payment. Uh, I pretty much agree with that. I think the biggest negative impact on me has been my health when I spend too much time sitting at the desk and not enough time actually going out and about. It's a weird thing that you have to spend a lot of time at the desk to protect forests. It sort of seems counterintuitive, but that's how it works. Um, but I agree. I can't think of anything that I would rather be doing. Um, I, am, I feel incredibly grateful for my life, for the people who are in it, um, for what we've managed to achieve, for the optimism to be able to keep on going about what we might still be able to achieve. Um, so I still feel like it's worth trying to inspire people to have a go. And not just not just about forests, it's about everything. That, you know, it's it, that if we want change, then we have to... We have to make that change. We have to be energetic about it. We have to be bold. We have to be courageous. We have to realise that we don't get another go. So, um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm hopeful that uh, we can actually, the time has come. We can, we can see the public land forests protected um, before too long from logging so that we can have a reserve system that is a bit connected, that has a chance to uh, be resilient to climate change. And, um, and as well as that, I feel, uh, you know, we are incredibly privileged in this country and I feel like uh, putting a little bit of effort into trying to support those in the countries where environmentalists are being shot um, is a really worthwhile thing. So. Uh, anyone who wants to be on, well, the NIFA Leaf newsletter or the RIC newsletter to keep abreast of what's happening um, in those parts of the world where, where we're trying to do stuff, um, trying to support those people, then um, please be in touch. We'd love to grow our support base. Um, yes, uh, what they all said, um, and um, what else can I say? If you don't fight, you lose. And um, I feel like I got saved a lot more than anything that I saved. That, uh, you know, like, uh, I'm just so grateful for the life that uh, came my way as a result of the good fortune of being at uh, the Channon Market that day when Dudley Legger got on the stage and told everyone to come to Terrania Creek on Monday and I was like, where's that, you know? <laughs> but anyway, yeah, so uh, what, a, what an Im immense privilege. Uh, I'm eternally grateful. Thank you all. Jenny's kindly... Uh, let me just do a, a few words for the sign off. And some of the words I'd like to start off with is, this region, this nation, and the future generations hold a deep appreciation and a long gratitude for all the years, work, and effort that these people, as leaders, have put into protecting what needed to be protected and being so much in the future of their thinking of what was needed at the time and needed again now more than ever. A great hand for these people for what they've done. Can I, can I further just add before we leave? John, I noticed Dudley Legwitz quietly sitting up the back up there. He arrived during the talk. And Dudley was very instrumental also at Terrania. And giving regard to these people here, 
I've been working on a little project myself over several years. And on Saturday, I launched the website called rainforestwarriors.com. And it tells the story of Terrania. It has a history section. It has a cultural section. And it has links to all your work, John Seed, the rainforest information. It has links to NIFA's work. It has all the songs on it that you can play from Lisa Yates and all the other. So the full album is on the website. And it is structured around for future generations to hold an awareness of what's been done and what is also a part of this region's culture. So I invite you all, so it hasn't been publicised all that much because it's just launched on the weekend in time for here. And so it's rainforestwarriors.com and it's associated with the book, The First Rainforest Warriors, which is held in the Environment Centre. But um, yes, uh, and I invite you to look and also pass that link on to teachers. It's a great uh, resource for teachers uh, and for school children. So pass it on to your families, pass it on as a history resource, a learning resource, and once again, a great hand for these people.